are watching a Fact TV presentation of the town of Swansea. I'll call the meeting to order. Make a motion we approve the special meeting minutes of February 5th. Second. Anything further? All in favor? Aye. Make Aye. a motion we approve the regular meeting minutes of February 6th. Could we have a minute here and have our meeting, please? Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Make the motion we approve the consent agenda. Anything to add? No. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Public input. Anything for the good of the order? If not, we'll move right on to Tim Bell. How you doing? So, Mr. Bell, uh, hoping to get current on his taxes, getting close, uh, I understand, and he was asking if there was any consideration from the select board to waive some of the remaining interest. There's about $500 left of interest. So, as you know, it's been a long process. He's made tremendous progress. So, uh, I think some, some act of good faith contingent on receiving the outstanding principal uh, would, be, would be reasonable. And I may say at that point, I was going to write a check to full to clear it to get us off. Nice. What's the balance? Is it what's written here or is it what's on your spreadsheet? Uh, when you say written here, in the it, letter. Well, yeah, Tim has his written. Yeah, I would go by the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet? Because that's out of the tax system. Okay, so it's substantially different. I think he made a payment after. He made a $2,000. He made a $2,000. Yeah, 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 right. So after you submitted this, you, or when you submitted it, you made a fifteen hundred dollar payment. Was, uh, the, term, the next week following, I think I made the payment. Okay. All right. It's ninety seven hundred. He's yeah. asking for four eighty eight to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. What's your preference? Right. When would you make the payment, Tim? Um, within a week or so. What's the so? By the twenty. By the 28th, two weeks? Yes, yeah, yeah. Are we meeting on the 28th? Yeah. I'm fine with that. Okay. And we'll wait for 488? Yep. Do you want to do up to 500 and then continue some general a little bit make, make the motion. Beverly, I'll make the motion that we waive up to $500 in interest from Timoth Tim Bell's, uh, what would it be, account? Property, Property tax. tax. Amount due? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Thank you. Right. You must be having a good year, so good for you. Well, I've been, I've been busting by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Congratulations. Thank Thanks. Thanks. Ready to go, Ben Dreyer? Yeah, you bet. Underwood Engineers, West Swansea Water Company. So just for a little bit of introduction for some of the folks who don't necessarily know, uh, the town received a uh, $50,000 grant last year to perform an evaluation of the West Swansea Water Company system. And so Ben is here to report back on, on that study. So we have Ben Dreyer here from Underwood Engineers, Senior, senior Project Manager, and Seamus Quinn, I believe, is on Zoom uh, and helped work on the project. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike, for the intro. Um, so tonight, I'll just give you a real quick overview of uh, the points we'll talk about in the presentation. Uh, I'll give you some background on the project and the history of West Swansea Water Company. We'll go over the existing water system and the conditions that it's in presently. Uh, we have some recommended proposed improvements. Uh, we'll talk about what the funding opportunities are, uh, what the governance structure would be like, and then next steps, and then we'll open to questions and comments. Um, so we are talking about the water system in West Swansea. This is over by the Woolen Mills off of West Street and South Winchester primarily um, in that area. The, uh, originally the West Swansea water system was constructed as part of the mill, Homestead Woolen Mills operation, and it was to supply process water to the mill. 
but then there were some residential homes that were, I believe, part of the mill, and, and so then the water system was extended to serve um, drinking water to those residences. Now the mills have been closed and um, it, it's under redevelopment currently, but the water system is still in operation and it serves um, primarily residential, but there's some commercial entities too, and uh, it runs as a privately operated water utility. Um, and, and just for context, as we're looking at this, uh, we are seeing an increasing trend of residential and commercial development in the West Swansea Village area, um, Route 10 corridor. And um, I'll give you a little more detail coming up, including some figures. But the, in, in general, the water system is aging um, and it's in need of improvements to meet current uh, and future demands. So, so the purpose of the evaluate, evaluation that we did uh, for the town was to look at the water system and what are the needed improvements and then to evaluate uh, the feasibility of the town taking over the system, owning it and operating it and you know, what would that look like. Uh, so here's some stats on the existing system. Uh, there's currently about 200 people that are served uh, by the system, that's through about 80 connections. Um, the, the groundwater aquifer is excellent and there's plenty of groundwater supply. So the table here shows the uh, current system demands. Put my glasses on here. Um, so, so some of the criteria that we evaluated on is 10 state standards in the DES um, environmental rules for drinking water. And so basically, when you look at a system, you want to make sure that you have, uh, can supply the demand with just one well in service. So with the one well in service that can produce f just over 500,000 gallons per day in uh, system demands, average day flow, 37,500 gallons per day, there's a surplus of 466,500 gallons per day. So plenty of water. And, um, still plenty of water when we look at the max day flows as well. Um, and I didn't, we didn't show the numbers here just for, for simplicity, but we did look at it, um, projected future demands when we did the study. And even under those conditions, um, with some different build out scenarios, there's still uh, a surplus of, of water. So um, the water source is excellent. Um, the water system, the supply consists of three uh, groundwater wells. Wells one and two are active wells, um, and, the, and that's what is currently supplying the system. They're located in separate pump houses. Um, I'll show you some details and some photos, but, the, but they're antiquated. Um, they don't meet current industry standards, and a lot of the equipment is uh, ready to be replaced. It's um, served its useful life. There is a third well, um, but that has been inactive because of some damage to the pump that occurred. Um, so so it's, a, it's a good well, but the pump is not working. Um, there's also a small pressurized water storage tank. Um, that's really to control like surges in the system. It's, it doesn't really provide um, storage and it doesn't provide any sort of fire flow, uh, which is important for a water system. So here is the graphic of the extents of the system. Just so you can be oriented, north is left of the screen. Uh, so that would be Keene. And then running through the center, this is Route 10. Um, page up is coming into the, the village area. And this little spot here is the uh, Woolen Mills. And then um, on the west side of Route 10, um, West Street, off of West Street is where the wells are. So there's, there's two wells right close together and then um, a third well that's separated. There's about 8,700 linear feet of pipe um, and there's, it, the, it doesn't, there's some dead end areas. So looping is important for, for redundancy in the system in case there was a break. So there's some, some of these long sections of just, you know, it, this, it, there's no other way. If there's a break here, 
Um, there's no way that folks that are down here are going to be able to get water. Um, and that's also important to water quality as well. Um, here's some photos. So I'll go kind of left to right, top left corner. This is uh, the pump house for well number one. Um, so you can just kind of see um, it's 1960s vintage. And well house number two, uh, we weren't even able to access that when we did this tour. Um, there's some issues, I think, with the door. So they just boarded it up. Um, this photo here is, is one of the well pumps. And this big black structure is the hydro, hydro pneumatic tank. So this works just like, you know, at your home plumbing you might have in your basement or um, as part of your water system. Uh, there's a, that becomes pressurized and it helps um, so there's not like a water hammer effect um, when people turn on the, uh, the faucet in the system. It helps equalize the pressure and also that way the pumps don't have to cycle on and off every time uh, someone turns the faucet. And then the, there's a chem feed system in here. Um, there was a, a, in the past um, some high copper levels uh, so they use soda ash um, and phosphate to control that. So that's the chem, chem feed and it's kind of uh, very simple, not definitely not modern standard. Um, go ahead. So after we kind of inventoried all of that and looked at that, um, we identified, you know, basic uh, proposed improvements. We're identifying in two phases. Uh, the first phase or first step would be to um, replace the well pump house and instead of having two separate pump houses for wells one and two it would be one uh, building structure uh, would replace both the well pumps with new pumps and it would also include inspecting and cleaning the wells and also doing some production tests to verify and confirm the um, safe yield that the amount of water that can come out of the aquifer and then the other big part of this, as we're looking at it, is, is storage. Um, right now, the system is at limited capacity um, be because it's limited by storage. Um, so new connections, there is, a, is limited opportunity for additional customers to connect. Um, and that includes you know, potential commercial developments. Uh, the second part of that is being able to provide fire flow. So it's also a safety consideration. Um, so for phase one and phase two, the total estimated project cost is $6.4 million. Um, so here's the graphic of the proposed improvements. Um, this time north is up. So Route 10 is, is running through the center of the figure. And here's the uh, well locations for number one and two, so there'd be a new pump house there. And then the tank location is driven by the uh, elevation, so we, we need to have a higher elevation so we have the right pressures um, to supply to the system. Um, so the pumps here would either pump up to a tank that's up on the hill, uh, this is old Leonard Farm Road, um, or an alternative location that we identified is up um, on Christian Hill Road on the other side of town. Um, in either case, it's about a 300 or 400,000 gallon tank and up to 4,000 linear feet of water main to connect the tank to the existing system. Okay, and then these are just kind of as a point of reference samples of recent you know, modern current standards um, treatment facilities. So, so this is the French Cross Road water treatment plant. They have some groundwater wells in here. Uh, this is in Dover. And, and then this is a sample of uh, a water storage tank in Plastow. So this is just to give a sense of what the new facilities could look like. And then, you know, I, I'm sure when everyone sees the $6.4 million uh, price tag on there, it's the next question is how is that going to be paid for? Um, and, and the improvements would primarily be funded through user rates on the system. Um, so just to give you some background information on that, um, right now the average annual rate for West Swansea Water Company users is $743 
per year. Um, that's pretty close to the statewide average, 718. Um, in the, in the, and we're getting that information too from the statewide database. Uh, they call it the, the dashboard, but um, that's where this graphic is coming from. So that's all um, public information that you can compare other water system user rates. So in the table, um, this is the components of that cost. Here's the total $6.4 million. That would uh, correspond with a 278% um, rate increase. So for a current uh, user that pays $750 a year for their water bill, um, they would then be looking at a, a $2,100 bill. Um, so it is notable. I'll also point out that these numbers are based on 20% grant funding. So I'll talk about a little bit more um, some of the grant opportunities. Um, we chose 20% because it's conservative. There are potentially opportunities to increase that um, funding participation level, which would then be able to decrease the rates um, on the users. I think the other thing just important to note about on the rates, um, the increase in rates is not necessarily a function of if the town were to take over the, the privately owned West Swansea Water Company system and operate it as a water department or some other um, type of entity. That increase is potentially there regardless of who is owning and operating the system. It's, it's a nature of the condition of the facilities and their need to be updated. Um, okay, so the funding opportunities. Um, there's a number of different funding programs. We are looking at a combined approach um, through some of you know, the ones that are better fit for this type of project. Um, and the primary one is USDA. Um, Rural Development has a program for water and wastewater facilities. Uh, so they would offer $950,000 in grant and uh, $3.85 million in loan funds. Um, Northern Borders Regional Commission, uh, the town has been successful securing grants uh, from this program in the past. And um, so we would be looking to file for up to a million dollar in grant funds um, from them. The DES, uh, Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, we put as needed because they primarily are focused on deficiencies. So they, they may come into play for the well house improvements, but not probably um, score competitively on their funds for the uh, storage component of the work. And then the uh, New Hampshire DES Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund, um, we anticipate some additional grant funds would be available from then. Um, so then the, the last line is, you know, $200,000 of general town funds. Um, that would primarily be connected to um, some matching grant that's needed for northern borders. Um, but in any case, that's the makeup of the $6.4 million. And on the far right, on the bottom, you know, that totals up to about a 40% grant uh, participation level, and the rest would be 60% uh, loans. When you say loans, would those be loans paid by the general taxpayers or loans right. paid by the water users? Right, primarily by the users. Um, and there could possibly be some conditions where, for example, uh, hydrant fees. So if the town was benefiting from fire protection on hydrants, uh, maybe there would be ways that, that the town would participate from the general fund if it was beneficial to the taxpayers as well. Which is similar to how it works with North Swansea for the hydrants. Okay. Um, the other piece that we looked at was, was governance structure. Um, I'll actually in this case work from the right to the left because, you know, private system is how it is, is owned and operated right now. Um, you know, that's governed under the Public Utility Commission. Um, and so even if the West Swansea Water Company didn't continue to own and operate it, somebody else could come in and do the same, have the same type of setup. Um, 
There's a lot of regulations under the Public Utility Commission and there's limited um, funding opportunities. So it kind of didn't seem like really one of the best options for the town. The two that we really focused on was either municipal precinct, which is similar to the setup for the North Swansea Water and Fire Precinct, if you're familiar with that, or um, bringing the water system under the town's governance as a town water department. Um, it would be, you know, possibly a division of public works. Um, there would be a town water fund to uh, manage the income uh, from the users and expenses to the system, uh, capital improvements and things like that. This is similar to what the town just did um, on the, for the sewer department, a wastewater department, transferring from the sewer commission. Um, so staff would, would primarily be town employees or if needed outside contractors that are licensed to operate. Um, and the funding opportunities are much broader um, for, for capital improvements um, that come up. I think some other benefits of the town water department is that there's some shared resources. So as far as um, billing and um, collections go or accounts go, there's um, staff that maybe could already be used that are already on staff with the town. Um, also, the users on the system, you know, it's kind of one-stop shopping. The town, you know, you pay your taxes to the town, you pay your user rates for the water to the town, and if you're on the sewer, you know, that your bills for, for that go to the town as well. So it's all under one roof. Um, there's a convenience to that. There's also, um, if you have a problem with your water system, it's, you know, the selectmen are also still involved there. If you were a municipal precinct, the selectmen can't necessarily help you with the problem that you're having with the water system. You have to go to the commissioners of the precinct. So you're, you'd be working with a totally different entity. Um, and as far as the precinct goes, there are some benefits of the precinct that we looked at. Um, that they do have a different tax structure, so that so they're allowed to apply some tax onto the properties within the limits of the system. So there is a opportunity to, for more funding there or additional revenue. Um, it would ultimately be less responsibility maybe on the town um, because a different entity would be um, running the system, um, and it would have its own set of commissioners, and that could be you know that could. If you have good folks that are running it, that's a that's a positive. Um, but if you don't, it, it can be a challenge. Um, so, in our in our report, it, we're landing on and recommending, and through our discussions with the town, um, looking at it being under the town water as a town water department, that would be the preferred approach. Um, and some of that's because of the success with doing the same process with the sewer department. Okay, so for our next steps, um, this is kind of concluding our effort on the study and the evaluation. Um, so over the next year, um, loan applications would be um, being submitted. And that's actually part of the you know, reason for being here and presenting tonight is that the town has submitted a preliminary application to uh, USDA Rural Development that would fund um, a preliminary design study for the proposed improvements to to site the tank locations to size you know the building and um, and I, you know finalize the cost um, and then there are also other um, grant applications that will be available throughout the year um, so that would then prepare the town for um, being able to put a Warren article forward at the 2025 town meeting in March um, to see if the voters would approve um, the uh, appropriating the funds. And then assuming that that passed, um, a final design of the improvements uh, would take place from 2025 to 2026. So it's at least probably a year, um, just shy of two years. And then 2026 to 2027 would be construction of the improvements. Um, that's probably a, a two-year construction period. 
Um, so I think that wraps up the overview and, and kind of summary of what our study evaluation was about, and we can take questions or comments. which we can just transition there you to go. any discussion on. They're good. I, I've been involved in it, so yep, <laughs> I'm fine. <clears throat> Mr. Water, Water Company man, you, <laughs> you don't want to know what I think. So we do. Is there any way that it, the, uh, besides being like an enterprise fund, that there could be a tax district if the town owns it? That yeah. In our discussions with the yes, they've they brought up the possibility of establishing a TIF district, you know, um, so that would be another way to gen generate revenue. Um, so that would be the, the thought on that. Might be a WIF district. Yeah, this Water district. improvement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We could do some kind of a betterment assessment or something. Yeah. Ben, how, how do you see the TIF forming? Would it be the, the entire area that could potentially hook up? Yeah, or I don't know if you, I, I'm, I'm familiar because of the TIF district in North Swansea to some extent. Um, I'm, so I'm not totally familiar with the process of establishing that. Um, but yeah, I think, so in our report, we did kind of identify some planning, some planning um, limits, I guess, of, of potentially could this system be expanded to the north and the south. Um, I think in the near term, though, it's really about this figure right here. So whichever direction the um, tank would go, because then you're going to get potential users connecting onto the water main between the tank and the existing system. Um, I think that would be the starting point. We're, we're showing numbers that are, you know, on a 20 year build out period. So I guess it would also have to consider what's the longevity of the TIF district. Like, is that a permanent? Um, They're not permanent. Right. No, right. Yeah. So, so those would have to, I think, be aligned of, of how long. We're, we're close to closing out the North Swansea TIF. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think the, the planning window of where the possible improvements are could line up with the um, with the TIF district limits. That, that would be what you're going to do. Okay. And for people who might not be familiar, TIF district is a tax increment finance district where the town determines some boundaries and then some potential improvements. And basically the assessments within the boundaries, any increases after the district is formed go towards paying for those improvements. So that's what happen, happened with Safford Drive. The district was set up, the road was built, and as development has happened, it's gone to pay off the road. So it could be a similar setup to this. It's 6 o'clock, so I'll open the public hearing USDA grant application intent regarding acquiring the West Swansea water system, well pump house improvements, and a new water storage tank. Had a question? I, just, I was wondering if we could get an explanation of how tips work. But I do have a question for you, Slide, which is, you said that we don't want to know, but I do want to know. No, no, I was just kidding. Okay. <laughs> but she likes to give me a hard time. All right, all right. This is a lot of good information. Okay. You know, it's kind of put everything together that I think there's been a lot of stuff out there. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we could probably hopefully get some questions answered and know what we're looking at. So I'd be interested in knowing what Scott has to say. Yeah, me too. We'll start a public yeah. hearing. Go ahead, Jay. Um, I'm just curious, what what's the condition of the pipes? Well, we're, we're in the I mean, are we in the public out hearing out to discuss yeah. the grant. The pipes are this is all part of it. Pretty good condition. They, the pipes running from that like, pump house two, where you see it there, yeah. all the way down to where the mill complex is, are cement transite pipes. That's uh, asbestos cement pipe. But uh, any time I've been involved with it, we've drilled into it and uh, put a service in. They're like brand new and cement. There's nothing. That's really good news. But I'm just wondering why we didn't talk about having to replace any pipes since it's been in service. It is talked about in their study, and, you know, in future years, maybe 25 years or something from now. But some of the pipe is iron as well. There's iron pipe in there. I don't know what the condition of that pipe is. I do know the cement transit pipe is in good condition. Okay. Mark? 
Yeah, so you know, this is a two, three, four year project, right? To, to, to when we get the construction and we complete it. Does that 6.4 million figure account for that time frame? There's a lot of unknowns in there. <laughs> It, yeah, and I think maybe you're talking about just inflation or the, the, the construction cost change because we've seen that over the last couple of years. So, yeah, they are. In, in our report, we also identify a planning range. Um, 6.4 is just the way that it totals. And it's also, um, so we, a lot of the cost is based on, like, recent work that we've just done. Um, and it is conservative, and we do have contingencies in there, so that does help to, you know, get at the projection of it's a couple years um, until we would actually be at construction. Um, the other thing is that this, um, the RD grant application that has been submitted is a pre-planning grant. So there, it's basically, a, this will be a specific engineering study that now will update that cost based on looking at it much closer. Um, this study was a little more broad about, you know, um, the merits of or the feasibility of the town taking over the system. Um, and the next study is more about specifically what is the improvements that are going to be needed and, and how is it going to be done. Um, so then those, those numbers would be much more um, more specific, and then that would be what would be brought forward at town meeting. So, um, just another question I have, just out of curiosity. So, well pump one and two are pretty close to each other. They could be in the same building, or they have different depths. You know what? Um, what would, what would be the reason? That was around seventy-seven feet, right in that area. Uh, from within a foot, depth is within a foot. They start off at eighty feet, as far as I recall. So they put gravel pack. So the reason for two pumps is either redundancy or volume. It was volume originally for the mill. It was volume because they had all the dyeing process down there, and they'd run those four-inch pipes and all those eight tails down there wide open, like until they're all filled, and those pumps just would both run at the same time there. That third well is a larger well than the other two wells. That was, I think, it was a uh, thousand gallons a minute when they put it in. Is what it was for. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they haven't used it, like you said, in a long time. The uh, pipe froze. And So we see the third well as a really an asset to the system for future because that would help that would provide redundancy but it also could meet demand if if the demand's increased and then operating with two wells is just appropriate for you know engineering standards to have the redundancy so if one well is either needs to be serviced or maintenance or or um you know, one fails for whatever reason, you, you can still operate the system. It also will allow the pumps to cycle back and forth, so you're, it helps with the longevity of the pumps to, to spread the load. Um, so it's, I think it's good that they, yeah, it's a, it's a benefit that they have them that way. So if it's not capped or betonite sealed, should it be enclosed and protected? Well, number three. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm not totally sure, and I don't really know what the status, I guess I, we didn't spend a lot of time looking at well three, um, just because we knew it wasn't operational and it, we kind of just said that would be a future phase. And, um, and so maybe we, have, we identify, um, you know, the, the cleaning inspection on well one and two and a testing whether You'd want to entertain doing that on the third one too, just to know, um, and and at least inspect it, I guess, to answer that question. But we'll I don't seal I, it and yeah. drill a new well yeah. later or something. So. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's, it's a question and a comment, and the comment is that to me this feels like probably the most consequential thing we've done in this town for maybe a hundred years if we go forward with this because of the potential impacts on development in that area. And so, number one, it, this seems like a really big deal, okay? Um, it's gonna radically change how the land in that area is developed, which leads me to wanting to know what Scott has to say, because I don't see how we can consider this 
without simultaneously considering how to deal with wastewater treatment. Those two uses, you know, tend to go hand in hand. And that's how it will be. If, if this is expanded right, the uh, future business expansion or residential expansion will rely on how that treatment plant works. And right now the treatment plant is at uh, not design capacity, but at uh, running capacity just like this system here. It's not at design capacity, but it's at uh, delivery capacity because of the uh, small storage tank there. Same way with the treatment plant down there. It's at, it's at running capacity or loading capacity, you would call it, because of, uh, actually because of more stringent uh, per uh, permit parameters put on the uh, town by the state. So do you not think, wouldn't it be reasonable, as we did in North Swansea, to be considering both water and wastewater pipes at the same time? Uh, you mean in the ground, or you mean just upgrades to the system? Upgrades to the system and yeah. pipes. Yeah, yeah, I think they probably are going to be looking at upgrades to the treatment plant system, mainly because of the new plant coming out that the town has to be on, and it's more stringent, and there are more parameters that the town has to be on. So there'll be upgrades to the plant probably. I don't know about the extensions of the sewer service there for now, but the upgrades to the plant first. And it might be the same with the water company, the upgrades to the pump system first, and maybe sewer system before this But it does make sense, like the Wilson Pond project, where we took care of a lot of drainage issues. We realigned the road, uh, you know, did the water and sewer. So. So the cost would probably be significantly higher. Well, I mean, if you're having the road dug up anyway, mm -hmm. then you come back and pave it once after you've done everything. You well, know, then it's then good. You have the pitch for the wastewater too. Right. You don't need the pitch for the water system, but you need the pitch for gravity on the way. And, and there'd be other opportunities for grants for the wastewater as well. So it's not it's not just all happening. And storm water and <laughs> so everything. So any questions on the grant itself? Or the RDA or the biggest thing to point out is that it's non binding, so if we are accept the right bet. Right. Not binding in terms of we have to proceed with purchasing the system or anything. That's to correct. Continuing to gather more information. Yeah. That's right. So this is the one where we're going to borrow the money and then if we do pursue it? Or is this for the whole amount? Is this for the... The current six grant application? Year? Yeah. What we're I talking about tonight. I believe that's only... Was it 45000 Yeah, the current grant is, I think... 34,000 is the ask. Um, so, so if, if um, based on the results of that and based on the town meeting, if it went forward, that 34,000 would be applied to the total package for 6.4 million. However, that is broken up the RD portion, um, which was roughly like a million dollar grant and I think 3.8 loan. So, so that would be applied to that, that figure for whatever RD funds are applied. Um, but if not, then it's just that, I guess that would be it. Yeah, not binding or you yeah, would just so stop. Not, not for the big, big number at this point. Yeah. The, the reason that they um, do it in steps like that is because they, it helps them evaluate the projects and who's the best candidate and the, to be successful in scoring for you know the full project loan application um, so they've referred to them sometimes as seed seed grants but the idea is that they're going to require all this information from you so they're giving you a leg up so you don't have to write a check to play in the game of um, applying for for a big grant application so they're giving you a hand to get you to the next step. So. Yes, My main question is, as you mentioned before, the, the dead ends, um, and is there any, any thought about fixing that by including a, making a loop there? Yeah. Um, as part of the project, is that? 
It's, we identified it as a planning recommendation. Um, it, it, I don't think it would be near term. Just the, the focus initially would be just getting the fundamental pieces of the system up to modern standards, which is the well houses and having the tank online. Um, that would then give opportunity if there were, if there are more, if folks connect, they want to connect to the water line in between you know the tank and the and the system more users also um, helps with the rates because it's being spread out over more um, more users and then there's other things that we had recommended in there about um, so it's part of the challenge is the way that the system has been operated to date there's no capital reserves so there, there's not like money in the bank to go fix the stuff that needs fixing um, but that would be recommendations for when, if the town ran it as a water department, that they would do that moving forward um, so that those future improvements could be paid for out of a capital improvements plan reserve. Um, the other one is that there's a system development charge and it particularly comes into play when there is commercial development, but, but basically folks connecting um, would chip in for the system already being in there, it's like a buy-in, and it's based on your how much water you're using. So, you know, the bigger developments would generally pay a bigger chunk of money for that. So that also helps with the revenues to fund those types of things. Yeah. Because it, it sounds to me as though the project is going to grow beyond what it is here, and it's it's not going to end with that six point four million. Right, but it would be. Um, but it would be funded on the way, yes. you said, by adding more users and so on. That's right. Yeah, or it would be when, when opportunities arise. If right. you know, someone wants to hook in over here, here either, then it might work its way down. Or maybe when the Route 10 project that's been in the state transportation plan happens, maybe that's mm -hmm. an opportunity to slide point when things are things are being dug up. might be an opportunity. I think the natural loop is to try to connect here. And then yes. you, know, you give it this long string. So. Yeah. I think it's going to be driven somewhat by demand and then somewhat by opportunities. Yeah. Yes? What's going to be the decision process for, do, for deciding on which of the two proposed locations for the tanks? What do you think? I think Money. the planning board should be involved <laughs> in that. Because that's really... Well, plus where you got it, especially on Atlantic Farm Road, there's three farms up there. If you talk about people tying in, Farmers are not going to want to tie in because it'd be too expensive. Myself, I use up to 200 gallons a day at two wells. So, do you think this direction makes more sense? Going up towards this way, towards down the uh, I don't street? Know Christian, where you're in Christian Hill Road, there's a farm up there, too. Well, I guess think less about what specific, uh, they haven't necessarily identified a specific property. Think yeah. less about the specific property, but more about the direction out this way mm -hmm. versus out this way. Do you have an idea of what you think makes Well, the one that looks like with, with the old land of farm it looks like it's on almost like on Amlock's farm up there. And, uh, if you put decide to put that up there, you're going to have a war in the end. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> Do you have any property up there that would be good for a water tower? <laughs> if you want to stick it out in the middle of the woods, you're not going to put it on a pasture. Yeah. Molly won't let you on there. Scott, yeah, that there is another question to be answered, and that is, if the town does have it as a franchise or as the town-owned municipal uh, water system, will uh, everyone living in the group be required to hook up to it? You know, like they did with the sewer, everyone's required to hook up to the system if it went within a certain distance of your house. Would that be required? And if it would be required, maybe some pushback from there, and also it might make more sense to run up Christian Hill because there's sewer. And with the sewer system, I should have this, but are they, if they have a functioning system, they're not required. Uh, they have until the system fails, right. Right. which they've all failed by now, but uh, that, they had that. But in the well thing, you know, you can say until your well fails, well, that's probably not going to fail. Yeah. Be. But then they do get the benefit of having the fire protection, so that's why something like a precinct tax or a TIF district tax. Right, it's totally different than that. Right, that's but I'm just saying that. Required to hook up to right. But if they're not yeah. hooking up, yeah, and still, we don't have, have a to, tax. Yeah, you'd have to say what the district is, right? Yeah, in 
in order to uh, have the tax pools able to fund out. Yeah. And the only thing I would say with Christian Hill for a location is it would be two river crossings, uh, one existing, and I, yeah. I think the Dem and Thompson one we would want to cross yeah. and make that a loop. Yeah, so we actually saw that as a benefit when we were kicking that around the office a little bit, that, that for that reason it would give you some redundancy um, for that crossing and the, and the opportunity to loop, too. Yeah. 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 So what would be the process for deciding Well, it would be, we'll look at that closer when we do the report, this next report. Um, but, so, some of this dialogue is helpful, right? Because, it, because it's, I don't believe the town owns any property up there, so either the town would have to talk to someone about buying property or getting an easement to site the tank, because it does take up some room. Um, so that, I mean, there's, so there's probably like a couple of different factors that way. Um, it's about the route, you know, so we, would run some more specific costs um you know <clears throat> like when we generated these costs we just kind of based on numbers from other stuff we did know how much does a 12 inch water line cost in general and apply that to the length but at this next level we would go and look in there and look at the different roads and and do it more detailed so we could evaluate does one have a cost advantage over the other and then you got to weigh that against x access or you, can you get a site um, the other one that is not on the graphic, but we did talk about in the report. If you remember the picture, you know, it's a standpipe, they call it, but it, it's, it could be, um, you know, 15 feet high, and it's just a big tank, and you're using the elevation of the hill for the water pressure. The other way to do it is it could be more central, it, be, it could be closer, but it could be an elevated tank. So, so then you know, that could come into play too. But we just didn't have the time to look at all of that in detail. Okay, so technical considerations. Yes. There, there should also be planning considerations. Sure, you know, yeah. Where we want the nodes of development. Sure. And like you said, the easement costs yeah. and everything at the property costs, so. Yes, Scott? And there's also a bridge going out there at some point on Christian Hill, right? And they're gonna replace that railroad bridge, and that would be you know, probably the route that that water line would run through. Yeah, all right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the old Leonard Five Road route, which you got to realize too, you got to rebuild that whole road. That's nothing but a dirt and a half. Also, um, I mean, if you were, will, uh, if you'll require people to hook up to it, uh, I think you have to give some thought to, let's say, farmers, farmland, right? Because now if they're getting more than water through a town system versus their well, that's a big expense. Um, so, you know, will dual water sources be allowed? Uh, and if so, you know, what you know, pretenses? Uh, I think both those routes you're going to find a lot of private wells up there that people don't want to give up. How high would a water tower have to be? Um, so it would depend on the location. Um, the contours are going to be hard to see on there, but we're basing it, I, th I believe it was on elevation 660. Um, so when they're elevated, you know, they could be a, up to 100 feet, 100 feet with a, with a tank on top. Um, if it's a standpipe and just at the top of the hill, they're, they're probably only 15 or 20 feet high. So. So I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm just thinking about what it looks like. And sure. What the tower would feel about having a tower. They're beautiful. <laughs> I, I've lived in places where there are water towers, and yeah. I'm certainly happy with them myself. But I'm yeah. not sure everybody is. So yeah. Sticking on Sarasvall's land way back there, and nobody can see it, and they just would be happy. Yeah. Remember, next time use one of those blue glass tanks for your picture. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Ben, could you discuss the likelihood that another private company would take over? And, um, and what? Yeah. And and also <clears throat> maybe expand on why there's no capital reserves, why there's no improvements, what yeah. the restraints are that a private company has. Okay. Um, yeah, I I I'm not sure that I could predict the possibility or the potential for the, uh, another private company, but I will say that there is I'll, I'll call it outside interest in the um, in the aquifers, 
like it's 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 known that those aquifers are excellent and that there is a value to that so um we did a study with net nearby or next door with Keene about their water system and it was a planning study and they identified the potential to hook on to or um, they were eyeing those aquifers so so that would be a, a municipal entity that's interested in it um, but but I, I I would there could be someone out there that I sees that as an opportunity or the value of it and and would, and would be interested so they would buy it more for the aquifers and not for the system well or and or the system yeah because of seeing the potential of being able to sell the water you know I mean other maybe farther outside chances are like someone could like try to bottle water or something but I don't think I don't think that has a lot of probability um, the challenge with the privately owned system so this kind of goes to the second part of your question but also in context of the first with who would buy it is the Public Utility Commission regulates um, you know private utilities including if it's a water system so there are more you know regulatory hurdles for them to comply with then they would basically I think spend more resources um, complying and so I think there's less margin for small-scale operations I think some of the bigger systems it works for them because there's so much volume of water that they're selling um, so I, I think it may continue to be hard for it to as long as it's operated as a small system unless there's some other revenue source like they start selling the water in bottles or something um, for context part of this study was reviewing financial information yeah i think they made like eleven thousand dollars right in the year most recently uh, and, and and probably on average right yeah so so that's that's, that's what the kind of margin they're looking at right, right now. so even if they were able to save that for capital reserves yeah. it's going to take a while to get to any of these right. Yeah. Where I wanted you to go with that is that the point is that they're restricted on what they can charge because obviously yes. they prefer to make more than $11,000 sure. a year, yes. but they're not allowed to. Right. And as a result of that, they, they have no capital reserve. They have no ability to improve yeah. the system. And I'm just wondering if that would apply to another private company if it came in and didn't buy it for the aquifers but just bought the system. For the system, yeah. I, w I would say that would be... I don't. I wouldn't see too many people being interested to just continue it on in its current state. Or, you know, there's not um, there's not a bunch of money in it. I guess, right? Like yeah. that's unless it was some there's no bigger. Debt, there's no nothing to pay debt service if yeah. you were to buy it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think and I think part of the answer to that too, anybody coming in would have to come in with capital in order to get the system so that there can be more connections because that's part of the answer to solving that um, the revenue problem too is is ultimately the the more connections is going to help to make it uh sustainable so right now it's not in a sustainable um kind of state i think it's important <clears throat> for people to understand why we're even doing this and and part of it of course is to to manage development and allow development but the other part is we've got as I think there's more than 200 people that are, or 200 households being being served by the system. Yeah. And if the system were to fail, which it's maybe not on the verge, but it, it's it's a lot closer to failure than it is to success. Yeah. Uh, and then the burden would fall <clears throat> potentially back on the state or the town. But in the meantime, we'd have all those all those people with, without water, right? And without a source of water. And and one of the challenges. And, and Mike will certainly be able to attest to this as a, as a fellow realtor. People think Swansea operates that system. Mm -hmm. even, even owners that are paying their bills, uh, if they have a question, call the town to, to get an answer, not understanding that it's truly a private system. And, and it's often listed in listings as municipal water, which yeah. it's not municipal water. So right. there, there's a lot of confusion with it. And I, I think it's a multi-pronged approach, and that's why we're, we're looking at it. I think one of the things we have to do before the next meeting is put the funding stack together so people understand we have a we have a way to mitigate it with the TIF district 
Uh, we should get more detail with regard to the grants and the loans and which ones are forgivable and which ones aren't. Yep. And if they're not, what the interest rate is because it's relatively attractive compared right. to what people normally experience and, and how we would go about it. And it, it's a real decision between a precinct and the town taking it over. And, and if the town takes it over, then it's really critical that people understand what their, their tax burden is or won't be. You know, we, there, there's no tax burden from Safford Drive except for the lost revenue. But in, but in exchange for that, we have increased development, increased tax base as a result. And as I said, we're just a couple of years away from paying the bond off, and we haven't even fulfilled the, the opportunity there, which we're on the verge of doing. So I think we just need to be a little more prepared with that as you, as you go along. Yes. And you are very prepared. I'll make it that way. But we, we need to put that funding stack together. Yeah. Yeah, point, point taken. That's, that's right. I wish my wife could hear you say that. <laughs> she hears you say it. It's just yeah. recorded, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's exactly what she's watching. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing else, I'll close the public hearing. We're good. All right. Good job, Ben. Right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Give you a minute if you want to. Yeah pick up your stuff or whatever yeah. unless you want to stay for the meeting mm -hmm. right now we're moving on to recreation director Ashley Crosby brownfield rental fees and approval of summer job descriptions you're never easy what's going where would on? be the fun in that that's right <laughs> did, did, are we still having the ice fishing we moved it to the 12 or uh, the 25th so we announced everything today. I got everything approved with Keene State College and everything approved with the state. We just have that inconsistency with the north side of the lake right now where we've got about six inches in front of the camp. But as you go out further, where the sun hits more, yeah. is definitely a little thin. So looking at the next 10 days, it's, it's hopefully going to be cold. <laughs> We'll oh, snap yeah. that north side back together. Yeah, I love that wind today. I, oh, that we went out there this morning to try to drill holes, and I'm like, I was not prepared for how windy it was going to be. I'm like, if this weather continues, that we're going to hopefully be in a very good spot. Sure. So I have all of. I don't know which one you would prefer to start with. If you want to start with brown, if you want to start with summer camp, we job have descriptions. Start with brown. So we have the uh, year to year comparison on page 68, uh, which shows. The rate, rate changes that she's looking at. Um, basically, as we know, we're trying to cover expenses there. The biggest expenses are uh, electricity and then seasonal wages for someone to help her line, line fields, do some raking. And no, it's, it's literally that time frame is to fill of cleaning the bathrooms, lining the fields, and because Good it's job, a daily, a daily three hour task almost sometimes depending on the condition of the field, if it's rained a lot or not. And so even at these relatively modest increases, which she's nervous about, she's looking at an estimated, uh, it says total property cost, but I think that was a total profit. Yes. $48. 68. Mm -hmm. oh, 68. Mm -hmm. The numbers are on the wrong side of the page, but. Mine aren't numbered oh, at all. Oh, get the other. Oh. Come on. Version two. Version two. Did page 67 is the public notice we were looking oh, see, for. It was in there. It was in there. It was so good you didn't realize it. So on the far right side, so we can see the comparison. And that gives a breakdown of everything we're expected to spend this year on the property as well, just to literally stock the bathrooms and line the fields. Did you run it by any of the people that would be renting? Or? I have, and that's where I'm worried about it. They're worried because we're so close to the season starting that they've already put their budgets in place, yeah. and that the increase can definitely probably impact them. So w which ones do you think are the most concerning? Well, I definitely know the men's league and the women's league are definitely concerned with that potential of the $10 increase from $90 to $100. It does price us higher than Keen. I just don't have the tax funding or the resources Keen has, though. And our biggest expense, in, and this even shows a breakdown of their potential seven weeks or 16 week season with two games a week on the fields of what they would bring in at that $100. And that's where we would literally be able to break even at that $48 for the season. And that's mainly just covering that seasonal wage and electrical. Right. Those are both budgeted on the higher end, 
but we're seeing electricity over the board like in that $3,500 range and our seasonal wages has varied anywhere between the first year we had somebody it was 27 no that was for, not first year the first year they were $34,000 last year was 27 obviously it was a rainier season so that's definitely budgeted on the higher end but I'd rather plan for the full potential use of the field all year long and not end up running a deficit if we do have the potential to dry summer. <laughs> I need less rain. Do we have any option to get additional uh, programs in that, that could offset the increased cost? It would have to be something that would have to run during the day, which makes it hard during summer with summer camp going on. I do have budgeted in here for the potential of JSB coming in to run their camp. They right. usually do a one week camp. Uh, the boys did try to run a camp there last summer as well, which would be great to see come back, but obviously rain affected them and they got, I think maybe one day out of their entire scheduled week. Is uh, he still interested? To... Um, they're under new, or I just reached out to Jim and there's have two new directors for both leagues that I've just got in contact with and just got their information. So I did send over saying, hey, would you like to see the new application for this year? Let's chat, because I've been trying to chase a person who's moved out of state and was no longer involved. That's a problem. Yes. <laughs> but is Jim looking for any, any use of the fields for his own programming? Not that I've heard directly from him, particularly. I know they've used the soccer fields in the past, but with the condition of how uneven that surface is, it makes it hard for the caliber level of programs that he runs, because they're more of those travel style mm -hmm. soccer programs that are going to come and look at the field and say, wow, I don't want to roll my ankle, which understandable. Sure. But I would love to figure out how we can obviously get additional revenue in there. But this is based on what's running for the summer already. If I'm open to anyone's suggestions on other things to do, it's just hard enough right now to be able to fit everybody in as we try to do already. And the weather plays the biggest factor. If we get a, the snow out sooner, I get them on the field in earlier April and it gives us a bigger time frame but if it snows longer and it's wet. Mm -hmm. Not having the ice rink over there though helps kind of get it out of the parking lot quicker so I can open the field sooner. Sure. <laughs> One less thing to unthaw. So this basically allows you to essentially break even. Yes, compared, and I know I didn't give these to Michael, I have my obsessive Excel sheets. I have 2022 and 2023 broken out the same way where in 2022, we lost $1,919.47. In 2023, we lost $1,071.54. And if this went through and you held with where you are, you'd essentially break even. Yes. That's the goal. Well, the goal is to be positive. But exactly. Move and in the right direction. For those nice improvements we're going to talk exactly. about tomorrow night. Exactly. Right? Well, that's where I'm at. The goal is to, I don't, I, it's not going to make a ton of money in the current condition it's in. If we can break even and we can start with these improvements and start really putting in a place where I can pull in programs that are going to want to pay more money to use a facility that's going to be in a better quality. Not to say it's in bad quality, it's just our bathrooms are definitely a sore spot sometimes. Well, not in the field. <laughs> yeah. So that's where I'm at with those. I am concerned that the leagues are going to be worried or are going to want to push back with the price increase. My goal is to break even. That's why we're kind of here to see if you'd want me to hold with what we've previously done so that obviously we don't break their budgets and keep goodwill with them or if we're really just folk, we really need to make sure that we cover our assets, I guess. Literally. Yes. <laughs> Any chance for advertising or anything? That we actually together. absolutely could do that. I could definitely set up a um, kind of like a uh, scholarship or a, a donor banner donation type deal. It would just be working with figuring out a company and then figuring out the cost for a banner versus what would be good to take in then for that fee to promote them on the field. Because we do have so enough. If you could get two thousand dollars that way, that could help offset. Yeah. I have no objection to looking into trying to get some field sponsors and things like that for the season and keep the price the same so we don't upset leagues. I didn't actually. Or we'll maybe have, have them. Maybe both, but yeah, maybe. Well, you want to now commit to receiving the right. you're hoping to get. Maybe have the league get the sponsors. <laughs> okay. But, right, I mean, Either that we or could or give them some fence space to put the banners. Yeah. And create an incentive where, where we share the proceeds. Yeah. 
Because even too, the fence that sits along the far side towards right on Route 10, that, that's great advertising if you put something up on there. The amount of people who travel down, up and down that road every day. Well, that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great idea. I, I did that with Jim and it uh, wasn't inexpensive. Perfect. Oh, and actually, it that's was, a, it's affordable, but not. Well, that's a good idea. Right. I could reach out to Jim as well just to see where they're getting banners from and how he's kind of setting that well, up. You've also got the lane fields. You can check with them and where, where they're getting. Yeah, they get everything from Bulldog. I do know how they do all of theirs. I didn't mean that. I meant the, the, the contributors, the people that are right. actually buying the, the banner. I actually have their updated sponsorship form that there we just were handed out to all of us you last just, week. You just went from break even to there we go. Good job. And this Sorry. is why I come to these meetings because sometimes I get very set in what we're doing and I forget to look for those outside options in different ways. Perfect. So I guess the verdict is where would you like me to stay with the rate then? I would say go with what you're saying and go back to the leagues and say, you know, we could allow you to sell sponsorships and hang banners on our fence to offset that cost. They might even make a little money. You know, it might be cheaper this year for them. So, yeah. Perfect. And then if they are interested, you can pursue it as a way to cover the I think cost. you can do both. Yeah, and there, there's, enough, there's enough fence space over there in the big scheme of it all that we can definitely, yeah. But I agree with Sly. I think you, you keep your rates, and if you have to negotiate, negotiate, but keep your rates. That's the, yeah. goal, the goal is to get you where you need to be. That was, I, you should have seen how long I've played with this Excel sheet to figure out where I needed to be. And you'll even notice there are things on the line items that don't have amounts because I, had to elim I eliminated them going, well, we can wait till next year on bringing this in to see what we can do to try to keep as much cost down as possible. They get a facility people want to come to, so add them back in and make it up on your banner sales. Yes. And we can have painted dugout sponsors. <laughs> it might also give you an opportunity to get sponsors for some of the other events that you do, the Easter yeah. egg and road races and things I've like that. I've been doing really well with sponsors so far for different programs and stuff like that this year. A right. lot of local businesses have really been reaching out very actively, and even when I ask, it's a lot of, can I give you more than you're asking for type mentality, mm -hmm. which has been fantastic from the businesses in our area. Good. Yes. Means you're doing a good job, Ashley. I'm trying. Perfect. I'm kind of excited about this. I didn't think about it this way. Job description. Moving on. Yep. Pretty much, my, they're mostly all the same. The only new one that we hadn't had before was our waterfront director and the CIT lead. The other ones have mostly just been updated based on kind of more realistic job expectations that people have been doing. Um, the CIT lead is um, pretty much I took over that position last year when we brought the CIT program in. It would be replacing me as the person with the kids. So if I need to remove myself from camp for a meeting, for something that needs to be tended to, I'm not leaving a bunch of kids high and dry with a counselor that I'm kind of saying, here's some kids, they're doing X, Y, Z, and now they're not getting the full experience of the program because it was my thought process and it has to now be passed off to somebody else. The goal of that CIT lead is they would come in and direct that program. And I obviously would come in and help assist with all of the trainings that we would do with the CITs, like our safe sitter essentials, our CPR, things like that, but giving them a direct person that would handle them all the time so that they are guaranteed somebody there eight to four while they're there at camp without me going okay i need you to hang out with the camp count or the camp count or the camp director while i go run to a meeting for an hour and i'll be back type thing we need to get you to the point where you're running an operation and not lining the fields yes so yeah. I'd, I'd certainly be in favor and that's the same thing with the waterfront director um the person i'm thinking of for this position has been a lifeguard since the first day i've come into summer camp so this is going to be her fourth summer with me. Um, she's also become our swim instructor certification. She's stepped up and is planning for private lessons, our public swim lessons, and pretty much going to help oversee all the lifeguards at the beach because that tended to be a little bit of an issue towards the end of the summer where the lifeguards would run into an issue in the evenings and I would be 
at a event with a child or dealing with another issue or over at a softball field. It's just kind of an additional body to help support the lifeguards and then also really enforce our swim lessons for the public and our private lessons that we're going to bring in for the public as well. And, and the rates that you're charging are, are increasing to the point that these are revenue neutral? Yes, so it's all based on, um, these were all put into the budget that I originally presented for 2024. And then with that, they're all following the labor grades for all of the different categories that my staff fall into for the projected plans. Excellent. Where are we with the lane fields, the, our agreement there? I don't know where, what, where we, we are in the- We have been discussing back and forth with them. Uh, we meet tomorrow to hopefully have a final discussion and get everything signed. Okay, are we looking at five years instead of three years? Um, ideally, we were originally gonna propose a one year just because it's so, they're potentially looking at turnover with their president in the next year and a half. Um, and I think a one year, if they're just gonna sign it, makes it a little easier in the long run just because there's potential of all their turnover. Um, we are debating right now on a um, fee for the fields just to mainly cover the electrical costs that the town is incurring for the cook shack and the maintenance barn. Um, but hopefully that will be hashed out in our discussion tomorrow. Good for you. We, I, I love what they do and they run an amazing program, but we're, we're eating a lot of money to not see any of it come back our way. Mm -hmm. And my goal again is to break even. <laughs> I'm not looking to make money off a program that's doing a wonderful service for the town that I can't produce at their caliber. And they're pushing for a one year? They are not, they're pushing for a two year. Because oh, yeah. well, knowing that their president is gonna probably turn over in about a year and a half. Okay. So that was where we were going back and forth a little bit on it. My goal is just to try to keep it as whatever is going to be the easiest to renegotiate. And I'd love to get to the point where we don't even have to negotiate. And it's a, we meet and it's a good way to also make sure I get an updated um, certificate of insurance every single year from them. I get the application, I get the insurance. If I don't get the application, it's one of those, oh, it's January, March, I've got to go, go to them and get an updated thing. In my mind, it kind of went a little easier if they just went hand in hand. Could you send me a copy of the contract? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. I'd like to make a motion on the brownfield rental fees and the summer job descriptions. Did you get that, Beverly? We put her to sleep. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Great job, Ashley. Congratulations. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for your time tonight. Thank you for yours. Did you have an office space? I did. Um, <laughs> next night, I would serve in the basement. Hey. It's working great though, I'm not gonna lie. Hey, I got space in my bowl of arm. <laughs> See? Well I I, share with the spiders, but as somebody who's very cold sensitive, I've actually really enjoyed I, being able to roast. Excuse me, I, need to, I do need to ask a question about that motion. Sure. Was the motion included the increase in the brownfield fees? Yes. So you are increasing the fees? Yes, as proposed. Oh so, okay, I thought you had agreed not to. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. Nope. We're going to try and have the renters offset with some uh, advertising. Understood. And the amount of people in those men's and women's that own the business that sponsors the team. Yeah. Might be a good place for them to put another banner. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Under new sure. business, Board of Selectmen annual report. So I gave you the, the board report, uh, the packet, and then I also provided some dedication and memorials consideration. Looks good. And there'll be some pictures with these. Yeah. So just for a while since obviously not reading what we're looking at, we're talking about dedications to Chairman Ken Colby and Deluzio Ambulance. And then in memoriam would be Peter Johnson and Robert Herrick. I didn't know if he was a lifelong resident. I was going to put that like in one of the other team. Good question. We'll find out tomorrow. Okay. Don't be afraid to look that over though. any commas, I guess. I will. Curious about the, the semicolon, but it's, it's an interesting. Isn't that right? No, I have no clue. I think it's interesting. I'll, I'll take a look at it. I'm going to look in different punctuation into my writing. <laughs> You're doing a hell of a job. Did I miss anything big on the uh, 
I can't read that quickly. Well, so you had this the, the, on Monday. I told him there was I one, com that. one comma missing. Otherwise, well, you didn't tell me where. Yeah, I did. You didn't find it? Is that the bottom? You need consensus? That'd be great. Consensus. We're also still open to cover ideas. I know what Ken would say. What's that? Ken. Uh, if you want. <laughs> I'm with you a lot, Ken. I don't want people like that. <laughs> that much attention. Um, I mean, that's kind of a negative. It's also kind of a positive. But you know, we had the floods. Yeah. Survived that. I know pictures of that. Didn't know how you feel about that. Um, yeah, maybe uh, something with DPW to acknowledge what they did. Yep. Um, some live action photos from that time. For permanent work. Yeah. Um, right. Um, yeah, okay. Does that work for you, Bill? Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll go with that then. Thank you. 2024 town meeting and election preparation. As needed. As needed. How, how are we handling the town clerk's responsibilities? Uh, my understanding is, you say at the election? My understanding is all the election officials are still responsible for their duties other than they're not allowed to do anything with the ballots. So the can, can the, the two of them alternate? It's up to them if they want to name someone. I don't know if they're planning on campaigning at the door or if they're planning on working or if they're going to name, need to name someone from town. I'm not sure. But I will ask them tomorrow. Or maybe they could just, one, one could be in, one could be out, rotate on a, a couple hourly basis or right. something. I will ask them. And maybe they'd prefer not to if it's a day like last year. Or today, the wind. Whew. It's just back. It is back. Any non-public ses sessions? Back. No. Good. Anything else, Bill? Motion to adjourn. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Reviews. Yeah, do we, we want to get those scheduled? Yes. So we're not planning on having a regular meeting next week, but we might have either that or other non public business next week. Okay. But we'll do it next week. Uh, we'll do the reviews next week, potentially. What are your thoughts on the uh, new selectmen being involved as far as just getting their feet wet for next year? No. No? All right. No, I think I, I, my, my goal has always been that we get them done. Before? To, well, well before. Uh, yeah. Hopefully by the end of the year or in January, we never seem to make that. Right. I think we should, we should allow or make, encourage whoever is elected to review them so that they, they have that right off the bat. But I, I, don't, I don't see a need to do that because they, have, they haven't had the experience of working with, with the department heads. I just don't see a purpose of postponing another month. That's me. What okay. about you? No, I'm good with that. What about I you? I go either way. I agree. All right, good, good answer. So we'll get them all done tonight. We'll get them all done tonight. Great, you guys are out with it. <laughs> the non-public that we weren't going to have. Okay, so Any we'll other take care of it next week. Public okay. input? If not, motion to adjourn. So moved. Can you second the best one? Yeah, I second.